Kalos Castanatas, the active side of infinity. Uh, I don't know, we'll call them the chapters here. Look here. This chapter or what here? Okay, part one, a tremor in the air. I'll call, call chapter one, a tremor in the air. Part two, the intent of infinity. And the music is at 432 hertz. In case you care. <laughs> I want you to think deliberately about every detail of what transpired between you and those two men, Jorge Campos and Lucas Coronado, Don Juan said to me, who are the ones who really delivered you to me, and then tell me all about it. I found his request not very difficult to fulfill, and yet I actually enjoyed remembering everything those two had said to me. He wanted every detail possible, something that forced me to push my memory to its limits. The story Don Juan wanted me to recollect began in the city of Guayamas in Sonora, Mexico. In Yuma, Arizona, I had been given the names and addresses of some people who I was told might be able to shed light on the mystery of the old man I had met at the bus depot. The people I went to see not only didn't know any retired old shaman, they even doubted that such a man had ever existed. They were all, they were all filled to the brim, however, with scary stories about Yaqui shamans and about the belligerent general mood of the Yaqui Indians. They insinuated that perhaps in Vicam, a railroad station town between the cities of Guayamas and Ciudad Obregón, I don't know that one, I might find someone who could perhaps steer me in the proper direction. Is there anyone in particular I could look up, I asked? Your best bet would be to talk to a field inspector of the official government bank, one man suggested. The bank has a lot of field inspectors. <clears throat> they know all the Indians of the area because the bank is the government institution that buys their crops, and every Yaqui is a farmer, the proprietor of a parcel of land they can call it his own as long as he cultivates it. Do you know any field inspectors, I asked. They looked at each other and smiled apologetically at me. They didn't know any but, any but strongly recommended that I should approach one of those men on my own and put my case to him. <clears throat> in Vicam Station, my attempts at making contact with the field inspectors of the government bank were a total disaster. I met three of them, and when I told them what I wanted, every one of them looked at me with utter distrust. They immediately suspected that I was a spy sent there by the Yankees to cause problems that they could not clearly define. Sound familiar? But about which they made wild speculations ranging from political agitation to industrial espionage. <clears throat> it was the unsubstantiated belief of everyone around that there were copper deposits in the lands of the Yaqui Indians, and the Yankees coveted them. After this resounding failure, I retreated to the city of Guayamas and stayed at a hotel there that was very close to a fabulous restaurant. I went there three times a day. The food was superb. I liked it so much that I stayed in Guayamas for almost a week. I practically lived in the restaurant and became, in this manner, acquainted with the owner, Mr. Reyes. One afternoon while I was eating, Mr. Reyes came to my table with another man whom he introduced to me as Jorge Campos, a full-blooded Yankee Indian entrepreneur who lived in Arizona in his youth, who spoke English perfectly, and who was more American than any American. Miss, Mr. Reyes praised him as a true example of how hard work and dedication could, could develop a person into an exceptional man. Mr. Reyes left and Jorge Campos sat down next to me and immediately took over. He p pretended to be modest and denied all praise, but it was obvious that he was pleased to punch with what Mr. Reyes had said about him. At first sight, I had the clear impression that Jorge Campos was an entrepreneur 
of a particular kind that one finds in bars or in crowded corners of main streets trying to sell an idea or simply trying to find a way to con people out of their savings. Mr. Campos was very pleasant looking, around six feet tall and lean, but with a high pot belly like a habitual drinker of hard liquor. He had a very dark complexion with a touch of green to it and wore an expensive blue, blue jeans and shiny cowboy boots with pointed toes and angular heels as if he needed to dig them into the ground to stop being dragged by a lassoed steer. He was wearing an, impec an impeccably ironed gray plaid shirt and its right pocket was a plastic pocket guard into which he had inserted a row of pens. <clears throat> I had seen the same pocket guard among office workers who didn't want to stain their shirts with ink. His attire also included an expensive looking fringe reddish brown suede jacket and a tall Texas style cowboy hat. His round face was expressionless. He had no wrinkles even though he seemed to be in his early 50s and for some unknown reason I believed he was dangerous. Very pleased to meet you Mr. Campos I said in Spanish extending my hand to him. Let's dispense with the formalities he responded also in Spanish shaking my hand vigorously. I like to treat young people as equals, regardless of age differences. Call me Jorge. He was quiet for a moment, no doubt assessing my reaction. I didn't know what to say. I certainly didn't want to humor him, nor did I want to take him seriously. I'm curious to know what you are doing in Guayamas, he went on casually. I don't mean, I don't, you don't seem to be a tourist, nor do you seem to be interested in deep sea fishing. I'm an anthropological student, I said, and I am trying to establish my credentials with the local Indians in order to do some field research. And I am a businessman, he said. My business is to supply information, to be the go-between. You have the need, I have the commodity. I charge for my services, however, my services are guaranteed. If you don't get satisfaction, you don't have to pay me. If your business is to supply information, I said, I will gladly pay you whatever you charge. Ah, he exclaimed, you certainly need a guide, someone with more education than the average Indian here, to show you around. Do you have a grant from the United States government or from some other big institution? Yes, I lied. I have a grant from the Esoterical Foundation of Los Angeles. When I said that, I actually saw a glint of greed in his eyes. Ah, he exclaimed again. How big is that institution? Fairly big, I said. My goodness, is that so, he said, as if my words were an explanation that he wanted to hear. And now may I ask you, if you don't mind, how big is your grant? How much money did they give you? A few thousand dollars to do preliminary field work, I lied, again to see what he would say. Excuse me. Ah, I like people who are direct, he said, relishing his words. I'm sure that you and I are going to reach an agreement. I offer you my services as, as a guide, and as a key that can open many secret doors among the Yaquis. As you can see by my general appearance, I am a man of taste and means. Oh yes, definitely, you are a man of good taste, I asserted. What I am saying to you, he said, is that for a small fee, which you will find most reasonable, I will steer you in the right to the right people, people to whom you could ask any, que any question you want, and for some uh, very little more. I will translate their words to you verbatim into Spanish or English. I can also speak French and German, but I have the feeling that those languages do not interest you. You are right. You are also very right, I said. Those languages don't interest me at all, but how much would your fees be? Ah, my fees he said, and took a leather-covered notebook out of his back pocket, pocket and flipped it open, what am I yawning for, and put on my face. He scribbled quick notes on it, flipped it closed again, and put in his pocket, flipped it closed again, and flipped it in his pocket with precision and speed. I was sure that he wanted to give me the impression of being efficient and fast at calculating figures. I will charge you fifty dollars a day, he said with transportation plus my meals. I mean, when you eat, I eat. What do you say? At that moment, he leaned over to me and almost in a whisper said that we should shift 
into English because he didn't want the people to know the nature of our transactions. He began to speak to me in something that wasn't English at all. I was at a loss. I didn't know how to respond. I began to fret nervously as the man kept on talking gibberish with the most natural air. He didn't bat an eyelash. He moved his hands in a very animated fashion and pointed around him as if he were instructing me. I didn't have the impression that he was speaking in tongues. I thought perhaps he was speaking the Yaki language. When people came around our table and looked at us, I nodded and said to Jorge Campos, Yes, yes, indeed. At one point I said, You can say that again. And this sounded so funny to me that I broke into a belly laugh, and he also laughed heartily, as if I had said the funniest thing possible. He must have noticed that I was finally at my wit's end, and before I could get up and tell him to get lost, he started to speak to me in Spanish again. I don't want to tie you with my silly observations, he said, but if I'm going to be your guide, as I think I'm going to be, we will be spending long hours chatting. I was testing you just now to see if you're a good conversationalist. If I'm going to spend time with you driving, I need someone by me who could be a good receptor and initiator. I'm glad to tell you that you are both. Then he stood up, shook my hand, and left. As if on cue, the owner came to my table smiling, shaking his head from side to side, like a little bear. Isn't he a fabulous guy, he asked me. I didn't want to commit myself to a statement, but Mr. Ray volunteered that Jorge Campos was at that moment a go-between in an extremely delicate and profitable transaction. He said that some mining companies in the United States were interested in iron and copper deposits that belonged to the Yaqui Indians, and that Jorge Campos was there in line to collect perhaps a five million dollar fee. I knew then that Jorge Campos was a con man. There were no iron or copper deposits on the land owned by the Yaqui Indians. If there had been any, private enterprises would have already moved the Yaqui Indians out of those lands and relocated them somewhere else. He's fabulous, I said. Most wonderful guy I ever met. How can I get in touch with him again? Don't worry about that, Mr. Reyes said. Jorge asked me all about you. He said he has been watching you since you came. He'll probably come and knock on your door later in the day or tomorrow. Mr. Reyes was right. A couple hours later, somebody woke me from my afternoon nap, which I should be taking right about now. It was Jorge Campos. I had intended to leave Guayamas in the early evening and drive all night to California. I explained to him that I was leaving, but that I would come back in a month or so. Ah, but you must stay now that I have decided to be your guide, he said. I'm sorry that you will have to wait for this because my time is very limited now, I replied. I knew that Jorge Campos was a crook, yet I decided to reveal to him that I already had the informant who was waiting to work with me, and that I had met him in Arizona. I decided the old man had, I, d I described the old man and said that his name was Juan Mateus, and that other people had characterized him as a shaman. Jorge Campo smiled at me broadly, and I asked him if he knew the old man. Yes, I know him, he said jovially. You may say that we are good friends. Without being invited, Jorge Campos came into the room and sat down at the table, just inside the balcony. <clears throat> does he live around here, I asked? He certainly does, he assured me. Would you take me to him? I don't see why not, he said. I would need a couple of days to make my own inquiries, just to make sure that he is there. Then we will be willing, then we will go see him. I knew he was lying, yet I didn't want to believe it. I even thought that my initial distrust had perhaps been ill-founded. He seemed so convincing to me at that moment. However, he continued, in order to take you to see the man, I will charge you a flat fee. My honor, my honor, honorarium, honorarium is a mount, will be two hundred dollars. I used to be able to say that. And the amount was more than I had at my disposal. I politely declined and said that I didn't have enough money with me. I don't want to appear mercenary, he said in the most winning smile, but how much money can you afford? You must take into consideration that I have to do a little bribing. The Yaqui Indians are very private. 
but they are all but <clears throat> they are always ways. They are always doors that open with the magical key, money. <clears throat> In spite of all my misgivings, I was convinced that Jorge Campos was my entry not only into the Yaqui world, but to finding the old man who had intrigued me so much. I didn't want to haggle over money. I was almost embarrassed to, uh, to offer him the $50 I had in my pocket. I'm at the end of my stay here, I said in a sort of apology, so I have nearly run out of money. I only have $50 left. Jorge Campos stretched his long legs under the table and crossed his arms behind his head, tipping his hat over his face. I'll take your $50 and your watch, he said shamelessly. But for that money, I will take you to meet a minor shaman. Don't get impatient, he warned me, as if I were going to protest. You must step carefully, carefully up the ladder from the lowest ranks to the man himself, who I, who I assure you is at the very top. When, and when I could meet, when, <clears throat> and when could I meet this minor shaman? I asked, handing him the money and my watch. Right now, he replied, as he sat up straight and eagerly grabbed the money and the watch. Let's go. There's not a minute to waste. We got into my car, and he directed me to head off for the town of Potan, one of the traditional Yaki towns along the Yaki River. As we drove, he revealed to me that we were going to meet Lucas Coronado, a man who was known for his sorcery feats, his shamanic trances, and for the magnificent mass that he made for the Yaki festivals, festival of Lent. He then shifted the conversation to the old man. What he said was in total contradiction to what others had said to me about the man. Well, they had described him as a hermit and a retired shaman. Jorge Campos portrayed him as the most prominent curer and sorcerer of the, era, of the area, a man who was whose fame had turned him into a nearly inaccessible figure. He paused like an actor, and then he delivered his blow. He said that to talk to the old man on a steady basis, the way an anthropologist liked to do, was going to cost me at least $2,000. I was going to protest such a drastic hike in price, but he anticipated me. For $200, I could take you to him, he said. Out of those $200, I would clear about 30 The rest would go for bribes, but to, <clears throat> but to talk to him at length will cost you more. You yourself could figure that out. He was actual, he has actual bodyguards, people who protect him. I have to sweet talk them, come up and come up with the dough for them. On these next two sentences, it's not printed on, on the book. There's a, a misprint at the end of the book, so I'm just going to read you what I can read you. I can't really even make up. In the end, he continued, I will give you a total missing words with receipts and everything for your taxes. Then you will, missing words, that my commission for setting it all up is minimal. I felt a wave of admiration for him. He was aware of everything, even receipts for income tax. It was quite a while. He was, quite a, he was quiet for a while, as if calculating his minimal profit. I had nothing to say. I was busy calculating myself, trying to figure out a way to get $2,000. I even thought of really applying for a grant. <laughs> but are you sure the old man would talk to me, I asked? Of course he assured me. Not only will he talk to you, but he's going to perform sorcery for you, for what you pay him. Then you could work out an agreement with him as to how much you could pay him for further lessons. Jorge Campos again kept silent again for a while, peering into my eyes. Do you think that you could pay me the $2,000? He asked in a tone so purposely indifferent that I instantly knew it was a sham. Oh yes, I can easily afford that, I lied reassuringly. He could not, dis I, he could not disguise his glee. Good boy, good boy, he cheered. We're going to have a ball. I tried to ask him some general questions about the old man. He forcefully cut me off. Save all of this for the man himself. He'll be all yours, he said, smiling. He began to tell me then about his life in the United States and about his business aspirations. And to my utter bewilderment, since I had already classified him as a phony 
who didn't speak a word of English. He shifted to English. You do speak English, I exclaimed. I explained, exclaimed, without any attempt at hiding my surprise. Of course I do, my boy, he said, affecting a Texas, Texas accent, which he carried on for the duration of our conversation. I told you I wanted to test you to see if you are resourceful. You are. In fact, you are quite clever, I might say. I may say. His command of English was superb, and he delighted me with jokes and stories. In no time at all, we were in Partan. He directed me to the house, on the to a house on the outskirts of town. We got out of the car. He led the way, calling loudly in Spanish for Lucas Coronado. We heard a voice from the back of the house that said also in Spanish, come over here. There was a man behind a small shack sitting on the ground on a goatskin. He was holding a piece of wood with his bare feet while he worked on it with a chisel and a mallet. By holding the piece of wood in place with the pressure of his feet, he had fashioned a stupendous part of his turning wheel, so to speak. His feet turned the piece as his hands worked the chisel. I had never seen anything like this in my life. He was making a mask, hollowing it out with a curved chisel. His control of his feet in holding the wood and turning it around was remarkable. The man was very thin. He had a thin face with angular features, high cheekbones and a dark copperish complexion. The skin of his face and neck seemed to be stretched to the maximum. He, he sported a thin droopy mustache that gave him that gave his angu angular face a malevolent slant. He had an aquiline nose and a very thin bridge and a fierce and fierce black eyes. His extremely black eyebrows appeared as if they had been drawn on with a pencil and so did his jet black hair combed backward on his head. I had never seen a more hostile face. <clears throat> the image came to mind looking at him was that of an Indian poisoner in the era of, of the Medici, uh, Medicis. The word truculent and saturnine seemed to be the most apt descriptions when I focused my attention on Lucas Coronado's face. I noticed that while he was sitting on the ground holding the piece of wood with his feet, the bones of his legs were so long that his knees came up to his shoulders. When we approached him, he stopped working and stood up. He was taller than Jose Jorge Campos, and as thin as a rail. As a gesture of deference to us, I suppose, he put on his guacheros. Come in, come in, he said without smiling. I had a strange feeling that Lucas Coronado did not know how to smile. And what do I owe the pleasure of this visit, I asked Jorge Campos. I brought this young man here because he wants to ask you some questions about your art, Jorge Campos said in a most patronizing tone. I vouch that you could answer those questions truthfully. Oh, that's no problem. That's no problem, Louis, Lucas Coronado assured me, sizing me up with his cold stare. He shifted into a different language then, which I presumed was Yaki. He and Jorge Campos got into an animated conversation that lasted for some time. Both of them acted as, as if I did not exist. Then Jorge, Jorge Campos turned to me. We have a little problem here, he said. Lucas has just informed me that this is a very busy season for him, and since festivities are approaching, so he doesn't want to, he, so, he, he, so he won't be able to answer all the questions that you ask him, but he will at another time. Yes, yes, most certainly, Lucas Coronado said to me in Spanish, at another time indeed, at another time. We have to cut our visits short, Jorge Campos said, but I'll bring you back again. As we were leaving, I felt moved to express Lu to Lucas Coronado my admiration for his stupendous technique of working with his hands and feet. He looked at me as if I were mad. His eyes widened with surprise. You've never seen anyone work on a mask, he hissed through clenched teeth. Where are you from, Mars? I felt stupid. I tried to explain that his technique was quite new to me. He seemed ready to hit me on the head. Jorge Campos said to me in English that I had offended Lucas Coronado with my comments. He had understood my praise as a veiled way of making fun of his poverty. My words had been to him an ironic statement of how poor and helpless he was. 
but it, but it is the opposite, I said. I think he's magnificent. Don't try to tell him anything like that, Jorge Campos retorted. These people are trained to receive and dispense, dispense insults in a most covert manner. He thinks it's odd that you run him down when you don't even know him and make fun of the fact that he cannot afford a vice to hold his sculpture. I felt totally at a loss. The last thing I wanted was to follow up my only possible contact. Jorge Campo seemed to be utterly aware of my chagrin. Buy one of his masks, he advised me. I told him that I intended to drive to Los Angeles in one lap without stopping, and that I, that I would had and I had just sufficient money to buy gasoline food. Well, give him your leather jacket, he said matter-of-factly, but in a confidential, helpful tone. Otherwise, you're going to anger him, and all he'll remember about you will be your insults. But don't tell him that his masks are beautiful. Just buy one. When I told Lucas Coronado that I wanted to trade my leather jacket for one of his masks, he grinned with satisfaction. He took the jacket and put it on. He walked to his house, but before he entered, he did some strange gyrations. He knelt in front of some sort of religious altar and moved his arms as if to stretch them and rubbed his hands on the sides of his jacket. He went inside the house and brought out a bundle wrapped in newspapers, and which, he had ha which he handed to me. I wanted to ask him some question. He excused himself, saying that he had to work, but added that if I wanted, I could come back at another time. On the way back to the city of Guyanas, Jorge Campos asked me to open the bundle. He wanted to make sure that Lucas Coronado had not cheated me. I did not care to open the bundle. My only concern was the possibility that I could come back by myself to talk to Lewis, Lucas Coronado. I was elated. But you must see what you have, Jorge Campos insisted. Stop the car, please. Not under any condition or for any reason whatsoever would I endanger my client. You paid me to render some services to you. That man is a genuine shaman, therefore very dangerous. Because you have offended him, he may have given you a witchcraft bundle. If that's the case, we have to bury it as quickly as possible. I felt the wave of nausea and stopped the car. With extreme care, I took the bundle out. Jorge Campo snatched it out of my hands and opened it. It contained three beautifully made traditional Yaki masks. Jorge Campos mentioned in a casual disinterested tone that it would be only proper that I give him one of them. I reasoned that since he had not yet taken me to see the old man, I had to preserve my connection with him. I gladly gave him one of the masks. If you allow me to choose, I would rather take that one, he said, pointing. I told him, go ahead. The mask didn't mean anything to me. I hadn't gotten what I was after. I would have given him the other two masks as well, but I wanted to show them to my anthropologi anthropologist friends. These masks are nothing extraordinary, Jorge Campos declared. You can buy them in any store in town. They sell them to tourists there. I had seen the Yaki masks that were sold in stores in town. They were very rude masks in comparison to the ones I had, and Jorge Campos had indeed picked out the best. I left him in the city and headed for Los Angeles, but before I said goodbye, he reminded me that I practically owed him $2,000 because he was going to start his bribing and working toward taking me to meet the big man. Do you think that you could give me my $2,000 the next time you come? He asked daringly. His question put me in a terrible position. I believe that to tell him the truth, that I doubted it would have made him drop me. I was convinced that, I was convinced of that in spite of his patient greed. He was, he was my usher. I will do my best to have the money, I said noncommittally. You gotta do better than that, boy, he retorted forcefully, almost angrily. I'm going to spend money on my own in setting up this meeting. I must have some reassurances on your part. I know that you are a very serious young man. How much is your car worth? Do you have a pink slip? I told him my car I told him what my car was worth and that I did have a pink slip, but he seemed satisfied only when I gave him my word that I would bring him the money in cash 
on my next visit. Five months went when five months later I went back to Guyana to see Jorge Campos. Two thousand dollars at that time was a considerable amount of money, especially for a student. I thought that if perhaps he were willing to take a partial payment, I would be more than happy to commit myself to pay him an amount pay him that amount in installments. I couldn't find Jorge Campos anywhere in Guyamas. I asked the owner of the restaurant. He was baffled as I was as I was about his disappearance. He just he he has just vanished, he said. I'm sure he went back to Arizona or Texas, 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 where his business where he has business. I took a chance and went to see Lucas Coronado by myself. I arrived at his house at midday. I couldn't find him either. I asked his neighbors if they knew where he might be. They looked at me belligerently and didn't dignify me with an answer. I left, but when I went by his house again in the late afternoon, I, I didn't expect anything at all. In fact, I was prepared to, prepared to leave for Los Angeles immediately. To my surprise, Lucas Coronado was not only there, but he was extremely friendly to me. He frankly expressed his approval of seeing that I had come without Jorge Campos, who he said was an outright pain in the ass. He complained that Jorge Campos, to whom he referred to as a renegade Yaqui Indian, took delight in exploiting his fellow Yaquis. I gave Lucas Coronado some gifts that I had bought him and br brought for him and brought to him three masks, an exquisitely carved staff, and a pair of rattling leggings made out of cocoons of some insects from the desert, leggings which the Yaquis used in their traditional dances. Then I took him to Guyamas for dinner. I saw him every day for five days that I remained in the area, and he gave me endless amounts of information about the Yaquis, their history, social organization, and meaning and nature of their festivities. I was having such fun as a field worker that I even felt reluctant to ask him if he knew anything about the old shaman. Overcoming second thoughts, I finally asked Lucas Coronado if he knew the old man whom Jorge Campos had assured me was such a prominent shaman. Lucas Coronado seemed perplexed. He assured me that to his knowledge, no such man had ever existed in that part of the country, and that Jorge Campos Jorge Campos was a crook who only wanted to cheat me out of my money. Hearing Lucas Coronado deny the existence of the old man had a terrible unexpected impact on me. In one instant, I became, it became evident to me that I really didn't give a damn about field work. I only cared about finding that old man. I knew then that the meeting with the old shaman had indeed been the culmination of something I had been, that had done nothing that, that had, wait a minute, had been the culmination of something that had nothing to do with my desires, aspirations, or even thoughts as an anthropologist. I wondered more than ever who in the hell the old man was. Without any inhibitory checks, I began to rant and yell in frustration. I stomped on the floor. Lucas Coronado was tight, quite taken aback by my display. He looked at me, bewildered, and then stared and laugh and started to laugh. I had no idea that he could laugh. I apologized to him for my outburst of anger and frustration. I couldn't explain why I was out of sorts. Lucas Coronado seemed to understand my quandary. Things like that happen in this area, he said. I had no idea what he was referring to, but I didn't want to ask him. I was deadly afraid of the easiness with which he took offense. A peculiarity among the Yankees the Yaquis was the facility they had to feel offended. They seemed to be perennially on, the, on their toes, looking out for insults that were too subtle to be noticed by anyone else. There are magical beings living in the mountains around here, he continued, and they can act on people. They make people go veritably mad. People rant and rave under their influence. And when they finally calm down exhausted, they don't have any clue as to why they exploded. Do you think that's what happened to me, I asked? Definitely, he replied with total conviction. You already have a predisposition for going bonkers at the drop of a hat, but you, are always, but you are always very contained. Today, you weren't contained. You went bananas over nothing.
It isn't over nothing, I assured him. I didn't know it until now, but to me that old man is the driving force of all my efforts. Lucas Coronado kept quiet as if in deep thought. Then he began to pace up and down. Do you know any old man who lives around here but is not quite from this area, I asked. He didn't understand my question. I had to explain to him that the old Indian I had met was perhaps like Jorge Campos, a Yaki who had lived somewhere else. Lucas Coronado explained that the surname Mateus was quite common in the area and that on the two, so however you want to say it. He didn't, I say Mateus. I didn't know any Mateus whose first name was Juan. He seemed despondent. Then he had a moment of insight and stated that because the man was old, he might have another name, and that perhaps he had given me a working name, not his real name. The only old man I know, he went on, is Ignacio Flores, Ignacio Flores' father. He comes to see his son from time to time, but he comes from Mexico City. Come to think of it, he's Ignacio's father, but he doesn't seem that old. But he's old. Ignacio's old, too. His father seems younger, though. He laughed heartily at his realization. Apparently, he had never thought about the youth of the old man until that moment. He kept on shaking his head as if in disbelief. I, on the other hand, was elated beyond measure. That's the man, I yelled without knowing why. Lucas Coronado didn't know where Ignacio Flores actually lived, but he was very accommodating and directed me to drive to a nearby Yaqui town where he found the man for me. Ignacio Flores was a big, corpulent man, perhaps in his mid-sixties. Lucas Coronado had warned me that the big man had been a career soldier in his youth and he still had the bearing of a military man. Ignacio Flores had an enormous mustache and had a fierceness in his eyes that made that for me made the personification of a ferocious soldier. He had a dark complexion, his hair was jet black in spite of his years. His forcefully gravel voice seemed to be trained solely to give commands. I had the impression that he had been a cavalry man. He walked as if he were wearing spurs. And for some strange reason, impossible to fathom, I heard the sound of spurs when he walked. Lucas Coronado introduced me to him and said that I had come from Arizona to see his father, whom I had met in Nogales. Ignacio Flores didn't seem surprised at all. Oh yes, he said, my father travels a great deal. Without any other preliminaries, he directed us to where we could find his father. He didn't come with us, I thought, out of politeness. He excused himself and marched away, as if we were keeping step in a parade. I put I prepared myself to go to the old man's house with Lucas Coronado. Instead, he politely declined and wanted me to drive him back to his house. I think you found the man you're looking for, and I feel that you should be alone, he said. I marveled at how extraordinarily polite these Yaqui Indians were, yet at the same time so fierce. I had been told that the Yaquis were savages who had no qualms about killing anyone. As far as I was concerned, though, their most remarkable feature was their politeness and consideration. I drove to the house of Ignacio Flores' father, and there I found the man I was looking for. I wonder why Jorge Campos lied and told me that he knew you, I said at the end of my account. He didn't lie to you, Don Juan said, in a, with the conviction of someone who was, who was condoning Jorge Campos' behavior. He didn't even misrepresent himself. He thought you were an easy mark and he was going to cheat you. He couldn't carry out his plan though because infinity overpowered him. Do you know that he disappeared as soon as he met you, never to be found? Jorge Campos was a most meaningful personage for you, he continued. You will find in whatever transpired between the two of you a sort of guiding blueprint because he was a representation of your life. Why? I'm not a crook, I protested. He laughed, laughed as if he knew something that I didn't. The next thing I knew, I found myself in the midst of an extensive explanation of my actions, my ideals, my expectations. However, a strange thought occurred to me. 
to consider which with the same fever which which I had explained myself that under certain circumstances I might be like Jorge Campos. I found the thought inadmissible, and I said all my I, I used all my available energy to try to disprove it. However, down in the depths of myself, I didn't care to apologize if I were like Jorge Campos. When I voiced my dilemma, Don Juan laughed so hard that he choked many times. If I were you, he com commented, I'd listen to my inner voice. What difference would it make if you were like Jorge Campos, a crook? He was a cheap crook. You're, you're, uh, you are more elaborate. <laughs> this is the power of the, the recounting. This is why sorcerers use it. It puts you in contact with something that you didn't suspect existed in you. I wanted to leave right then. Don, know I, Don Juan knew exactly how I felt. Don't listen to the superficial voices. Don't listen to the superficial voices that make you angry, he said commandingly. Listen to that deeper voice that is going to guide you from now on, the voice that is laughing. Listen to it and laugh with it. Laugh, laugh. His words were like a hypnotic command to me. Against my will, I began to laugh. Never had I been so happy. I felt free, unmasked. Recount to yourself the story of Jorge Campos over and over again, Don Juan said, and you will find endless wealth in it. Every detail is part of a map. It is the nature of inf infinity. Once we cross a certain threshold to put a blueprint in front of us. He peered at me for a long time. He didn't merely glance as before, but he gazed intently at me. One deed with which Jorge Campos couldn't avoid performing, he finally says, was to put you in contact with the other man, Lucas Coronado, who is as meaningful to you as Jorge Campos himself, maybe even more so. In the course of recounting the story of these two men, I had realized that I had spent more time with Lucas Coronado than with Jorge Campos. However, our exchanges had not been as intense and, had, and were marked by enormous lagoons of silence. Lucas Coronado was not by nature a talkative man, and by some strange twist, whenever he was silent, he managed to drag me with him into that state. Lucas Coronado was another part of your map, Don Juan said. Don't you find it strange that he was a sculptor like yourself, a super-sensitive super artist who was, like yourself at one time, in search of a sponsor for his art? He looked for a sponsor just like you looked for a woman a lover of the arts who would sponsor your creativity. I entered into another terrifying struggle. This time my struggle was between my absolute certainty, certainty that I had not mentioned this aspect of my life to him, but the fact that all this was true, and that the fact that I was unable to find an explanation for how he could have obtained this information. Again, I wanted to leave right away, but once more the impulse was overpowered by a voice that came from deep, from a deep place. Without any coaxing, I began to laugh heartily. Some part of me had a profound, on a profound level, didn't give a hoot any about finding out how Don Juan had gotten that information. The fact that he had it, and, and had it displayed it in such a delicate but con conniving manner was a delightful maneuver to witness. It was of no consequence that the super, superficial part of me got angry and wanted to leave. Very good, Don Juan said, patting me forcefully on the back. Very good. He was pensive for a moment as if he were perhaps seeing that invisible, seeing things invisible to the average eye. Jorge Campos and Lucas Coronado, two ends of an axis, he said. That axis is you. At one end, a ruthless, shameless, crass mercenary who takes care of himself. Hideous, but indestructible. The other end, a super-sensitive, tormented artist, weak and vulnerable. That should have been a map of your life, were it not for the appearance of another possibility, the one that opened up when you crossed the threshold of infinity. You searched for me, and you found me, and so you did cross the threshold. The intent of infinity told me to look for someone like you. I informed you this crossing the threshold myself. The conversation ended at that point. Don Juan went into one of his habitual long periods of total silence. 
It was only at the end of the day when we had returned to his house and while we were sitting under the Ramada, pulling off from a long hike we had taken, that he broke his silence. Uh, in your recounting what happened between you and Jorge Campos, and you and Lucas Coronado, Don Juan went on, I found that I, and hope, you did too, I found, and I hope, you did too, a very disturbing factor. For me, it's an omen. It points to the end of an era, meaning that wherever, whatever was standing there cannot remain. Very flimsy elements brought you to me. None of them can stand on their own. This is what I drew from your recounting. I remembered then that Don Juan had revealed to me one day that Lucas Coronado was terminally ill. He had some health conditions that was slowly consuming him. I, I sent word to him that my son Ignacio, I sent through my son Ignacio about how, what he should do to take care of himself all on and on. But he thinks it's nonsense. He doesn't want to hear it. It isn't Lucas's fault. The entire human race doesn't want to hear anything. And they hear only what they want to hear. I remembered that I had prevailed on Don Juan to tell me what I could say to Lucas Coronado to help him, help him alleviate his physical pain and mental anguish. Don Juan not only told me what to tell him, but he asserted that if Lucas Coronado wanted to, he could easily cure himself. Never, nevertheless, when I delivered that message, delivered Don Juan's message, Lucas Coronado looked at me as if I had lost my mind. Then he shifted into a, into a brilliant, and I had then he shifted into a brilliant, and I had been a yaki deeply. Let me say this again. Then he shifted into a brilliant. What does that mean? And I had been a yaki deeply insulting portrayal of a man who is bored to death by someone's unwarranted insistence. I thought that only a yaki Indian could be so subtle. Those things don't help me, he finally said, def def defiantly angered by my lack of sensibility. It doesn't really matter. We all have to die, but don't dare, but don't you dare believe that I have lost hope. I'm going to get some money from the government bank. I'll get an advance on my crops, then I'll get enough money to buy something that will cure me. It's so facto. Its its name is vitamin all. Vitamin vitamin all. What is vitamin all? I asked. It's something that's advertised on the radio. He said, with the innocence of a child, it cures everything. It's recommended for people who don't eat meat or fish or fowl every day. It's recommended for people like myself who can barely keep body and soul together. In my eagerness to help Lucas Coronado, I committed right then the biggest blunder imaginable in society of such, such hypersensitive beings as the Yaquis. I offered to give him the money to buy vitamin oil. His cold stare was a measure of how deeply I had hurt him. My stupidity was unforgivable. Very softly, Lucas Coronado said that he was capable of affording vitamin oil himself. I went back to Don Juan's house. I felt like weeping. My eagerness had betrayed me. Don't waste your energy worrying about things like that, Don Juan said coldly. Lucas Coronado was locked into a vicious cycle. But so are you. So is everyone. He has, he has vitamin oil, which is which he trusts with all, will cure everything and resolve every one of his problems. At the moment, he can't afford it, but his great hope, but he has great hope that he eventually will be able to. Don Juan peered at me with his piercing eyes. I told you that Lucas Coronado acts are a map of your life, he said. Believe you me, they are. Lucas Coronado pointed out Vitamol to you. And he did it so powerfully and painfully that it hurt, and you had to make and had to make you weep. Don Juan stopped talking then. It was a long and most effective pause. And don't tell me that you don't understand what I mean," he said. One way or another, we all have our own version of vitamin oil. End of chapter.